Jim Duke Radio Network. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. We are, as people, opposed to secret societies, secret oaths, and the secret Alistair Crowley has had a huge impact on society, especially in pop culture, as many model after some of his philosophies, even if unaware. The Hollywood cabal is shaped by some of his practices. Even music performers hint of his rituals. Some even contend that he influenced the New World Order. What is it about this figure that's so intriguing? Well, my guest, William Ramsey, returns with us to talk about it. William is a researcher and author of books such as Children of the Damned, Abomination, and Prophet of Evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order, as well as has a YouTube channel, William Ramsey Investigates. William, thanks for joining us again to give us your insight on this subject. Jim, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. And uh, I know that this is a controversial subject, especially uh, for some that claim to be Christians, and uh, they wonder, why are we doing it? But uh, can you tell us first how you got started in this research? What intrigued you to it? Well, I was always kind of a, a researcher into parapolitics. So even when there, before the internet, I would read tons of books. Really, I became interested in the events of 9-11. During the events of, or researching the events of 9-11, I kept seeing all these numbers associated with the events, 11, 77, 93. I really didn't know the numerical significance, but what they led me to was a person by the name of Aleister Crowley. So I really wanted to figure out who this person was. He wasn't really publicized. I had known things from like a song by Ozzy Osbourne, but I really wanted to know who he was and what he thought. So I really read every biography on him I could. I really read his books, many of them. I read his Confessions, which is a autobiography about 530 pages so once i read that i got a, a good picture of who this person was and i realized that he was very influential but he was also a satanist also a worshiper of the devil and probably one of the <clears throat> most well-known one of that type in history people are referencing him and many of the modern purveyors of witchcraft and, and satanism all know of or have studied some of Crowley's stuff so that's really what, you know, as a person, as a Christian, I was trying to figure out. So I really wanted to know what this person was about. And that's why I titled my first book, Prophet of Evil, because he thought of himself as a prophet of Satan. And, uh, you know, and I think that he really wanted to create change in the world by influencing people and influencing the culture, the global culture, really. And uh, in some ways, he was, uh, his, his intentions were realized. Some people may ask us, why are why do we need to know about this guy? Like, what impact or, you know, what's the big deal? How does it affect us? Well, that's a great question. I mean, well, how does it affect you? Because the culture that he influenced is a satanic culture, a satanically influenced culture. So Crowley believed in his dictum was, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. It's an 11 word phrase, but that meant... You're really a free person and unrestricted to sex, unrestricted to drugs, unrestricted to your behavior. And uh, his devotees are very influential. So I think that they're antithetical to the will of God. I think they're antithetical to Scripture. And so understanding this as Christians who believe, I mean, at least the, one of the fundamentals of Christianity should be the belief in a literal being that is in opposition to God, known as the devil, who's talked about in the New Testament, and understanding his works, especially here as we move towards what's known as the New World Order or the end times, uh, understanding one of its chief or primary ideologues is vitally important. So I would say if anybody has an interest in eschatology or prophecy, uh, an understanding of Crowley and his ideas is essential. Some say do as thou wilt is, is misunderstood. You know, they they say, oh, Crowley just meant to do what's good. 
not just to do anything, you know. And, uh, you know, we get the Nike commercials. Is that Nike that just do it? And I think that was even influenced by that phrase. Just do it, you know, do as thou wilt. Well, that's I would just I would easily dispute that. Um, I think that he really didn't. The sin for him was restriction. So he really advocated total freedom and it included all types of sins and uh, admonitions by by scripture and God that things you're not supposed to do, he would advocate. So I don't, I think that you can publicly reinterpret Crowley. And I think a lot of people do interpret Crowley as saying that he was a person who advocated for human advancement of human consciousness and uh, advancement. But my, in my view, Crowley was the exact opposite where he would uh, get people mired in, uh, things that are sinful and led, I mean, so many people around Crowley committed suicide or died early deaths or became drug addicts. So from his own life, and especially him as a drug addict, I would say that his aims uh, ended up in, in misery and uh, degradation for himself and his followers. Did uh, your research change your view of society uh, in any way? I mean, did you now, do you now have, have like a suspicion of the official narratives when you hear these incidents that come up? Absolutely. Absolutely. I understand, especially Crowley and 9-11. I mean, I don't believe that uh, 19 terrorists, you know, hijacked planes and brought down the buildings. I don't believe that at all. I believe that it was a magically influenced event that was planned ahead. So I do see a lot of these other um, events as probably involving, uh, you know, the intent to reshape society for whatever reason I think some of these events are. So I would say for Crowley, I changed my view of Western 20th century culture when I understood and saw that the founder of Wicca was a Crowleyite who received a uh, kind of like a writing to start uh, Wicca. His name is Gerald Gardner. I saw people like um, Harry Hay, the founder of the homosexual community, homosexual a uh, revolutionary really was uh, the guy was playing uh, piano at some of these early rituals involving Jack Parsons. So it's offered Kinsey, the sexologist, so-called sexologist was also interested in Crowley. So you can see um, Timothy Leary, a drug advocate and kind of like an illuminated person. You see all these people who were influenced by Crowley who changed society for me, um, society for uh, the worse. As a side note, I actually I met Timothy Leary uh, here in Albany, New York. He's I think from Massachusetts, next state over. Mm -hmm. uh, but he came over for a little seminar for a you know a sit down with a a, a bunch of students at a college, and my friend invited me there because uh, we were into dabbling into LSD then. Uh, but interesting enough, Timothy Leary boasted mostly on atheism and said that right. you know. Christianity and religion is the cancer of society, not drugs. So he comes across as a scientific atheist, yet wasn't he involved in the OTO? Right. Well, that's a great question. He was actually a member, a known member of the IOT, which is the Illumin Illuminates of Thanateros. So he is a known member of that, him and uh, Burroughs and some of these other characters. But he um, was highly influenced by Aleister Crowley and admitted as such. There's actually a kind of well-known video of him saying, you know, I'm, I'm here to carry on the work of Aleister Crowley, who worshipped this being called Awas, which was a way to veil his worship of Lucifer. And he received the Book of the Law in 1904 from this being. So Leary, here is Leary saying he's carrying on this work, and uh, um, it's amazing. So here he says, this is from the, uh, the video he had. I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think I'm carrying on much of his work that he started over 100 years ago. And I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said he was in favor of finding your own self and do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law under love. It's a very powerful, powerful statement. I'm sorry he's not around to appreciate the glories that he started. So you have this so-called professed atheist uh, doing stuff with Crowley, but he also did all kinds of weird things like as a supposed atheist, he was throwing Crowley's uh, sticks, these sticks that were from China that uh, basically helped you tell events and what was happening. So he had actually had Crowley's belongings in his possession. He believed that his life was kind of 
synchro mystically linked to Crowley because he was in Algeria in the same place Crowley was at the same time. Um, he was an advocate of drugs, which Crowley was a huge advocate of drugs. Uh, the sticks that he that Leary threw were called the I Ching sticks that he actually owned. So, um, and you see uh, this guy that Leary is actually involved in in social change, much like Crowley was. So, an advocate for this kind of uh, illumined social change, whereas Leary and Crowley. Isn't that something? How they mask themselves as atheists? They come across as though they're pop culture icons and I, i'm talking about leary now and 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 you know advocates for um turning on and tuning out or whatever <laughs> you know and, and and enlightenment yet he was an occultist and a lot of people don't know this about some of the background of these people that claim to be atheists or scientists and such you know they're largely we find uh interested or uh you know mentored by people like alistair crowley yeah, it's remarkable. It's, and it, I think it's a largely a secret. And I think that was why I wrote this book, is that the secret influence of Crowley or the unemphasized uh, influence of Crowley is something I think everybody should know. So why, why, so we understand a little bit about him. Can you tell us, like, you know, I'm sure he wasn't brought up in atheist or uh, satanic families. Can you tell us uh, about his upbringing? That's a great question. So Crowley himself was brought up in uh, a group called the Primeth Plymouth Brethren. It was actually kind of the exclusive brethren. They were a subset of a group by a uh, religious figure whose name escapes me right now, but his, uh, it was, uh, oh, it'll come for me. But he basically thought that he grew up in a very strange environment. He was, uh, his father died when he was 12, but his mother took over his education and, uh, he made a decision at a certain point that, you know, I'm going to rebel. And he, his mom called him the beast. And that was something that he um, identified with. He said he was fascinated by mysteriously prophetic passages, especially those in Revelation. Um, he preferred, he said he preferred the dragon, the false prophet, the beast, and the scarlet woman as being more exciting. And he re- revealed in their descriptions of torment. So, uh, he said he identified himself as the beast. whose number is the number of a man, six hundred and three score six. So most uh, most kids grow up, you know, maybe having a, a little bit of rebellion to their parents and getting into drugs, getting into a little trouble. He actually um, had this this uh, this intent to rebel to the point of evil. I mean, like yeah, absolutely. His, his, he said, yeah, here's so another really of his up. writings. He says, I could not dismiss the falsities of Christianity with a smile. I was compelled to fight fire with fire and to po- oppose their poisoned poultices with poisoned daggers. That's not, a little extreme. Yeah, here it goes. <laughs> hey, I, I was not content to believe in a personal devil and serve him in the ordinary sense of the word. I wanted to get a hold of him personally and become his chief of staff. Wow. So mo- most kids just want to rebel and, uh, you know, maybe dabble in some some of the world and he he had a total uh, extreme view i guess of his rebellion didn't he he did and the person i remember was john uh darby darby right right, right. in the 1830s yeah right exactly so his parents were followers of darby who was kind of famous for dispense dispensationalism yep didn't he uh he didn't he have like a, a fulfillment that he thought he was going to fulfill you mentioned that fulfill revelation of the dispensational uh, doctrine. He thought he was. Now, his mother Darby dubbed that. him. Yeah, his his mother dubbed him the beast. Correct. At first. Correct. When he was being bad or whatever, so that's how he he identified with it, and he wrote. Uh, and he just lot, went with it. I think that that's just what became his identity. Yeah, there was a, a a world's tragedy, which was something he wrote where he was talking about his mother. And how it was he cold. She always was talking about cold boiled Jesus with her friends, and he really rebelled against it, and he became uh, an antagonist. He was really an antagonist of Christianity his whole life. Do you think this is like a, uh, a an excuse for some to say, "See, that's why I don't really want to press my religion on my kids and my children, or or um, um, you know." 
why why people say this is why I'm rebellious the way I am because my parents put it on me. I mean, do people people use that as an excuse? And probably taking his lead in that excuse, huh? Yeah, sure they do. I think that he was part of that that kind of tradition is they rebel against the strictures of their Christian upbringing. But uh, you know, he was an interesting guy. I was like uh, the uh, he had all kinds of excuses for that. So here, here's another one of his quotes. The forces of good were those which had constantly oppressed me. I saw them daily destroying the happiness of my fellow men. Since, therefore, it was my business to explore the spiritual world, my first step must be to get into personal communication with the devil. So, I mean, how many people who are rebelling against the strictures of their Christian upbringing are that intent on going to the opposite side as far as they can go? I don't know. To have the... the you know, you have to almost ask if he was prompted, like, I don't know about those around him, but maybe even by a spiritual uh, possession, a demonic uh, spirit that takes on the the suppression of a child. Not that the parents meant anything by, you know, gee, don't bring your children up in the way they should go, like the Bible says, because they may just turn on you and become the beast. You know, it's not, it's not like that. It's But something had to prod him into something so rebellious that he had hatred, bitterness, and uh, evil in his heart. Yeah, I think that he was the only child. I think that he came from a wealthy family. He had what he called a boyhood in hell, being sent off to private schools, English private schools. So there were a lot of factors involved that made him su- such a you know re- rebel, like an active rebel against God and somebody who really dedicated his life. He didn't ever have to work, so really dedicated his life to uh, rebelling against Christianity in part, definitely. Did, uh, did his upbringing, was he like traumatized or abused or anything? Well, he did have a time where a bomb blew up in his face, and he was in a coma, and it doesn't seem like he was, um, it doesn't seem like, he had severe punishments at the schools, so that was, and he almost actually died in these uh, private schools where he was constantly harassed and bullied, so he had a... um, you know, I wrote in my book, it said the severe cruelty and privation at these Christian schools affected Crowley's opinion of institutional Christianity. But he definitely had some sadistic traits. He wrote a very detached uh, letter about torturing a cat, killing it, trying to kill it. Um, so, you know, he was uh, he was definitely different from an early age, no question. Wasn't he trying to, wasn't he trying to uh, take that up? Uh that um wives tale that cats have nine lives and really trying to extend the nine lives of the cat to see if he can kill it so here it is he says i've been told a cat has nine lives i deduce that it must be practically impossible to kill a cat as usual i became full of ambition to perform the feat therefore i caught a cat and having administered a large dose of arsenic i chloroformed it hanged it above the gas jet stabbed it cut its throat smashed its skull and when it had been pretty thoroughly burnt, drowned it and threw it out the window that the fall might remove the ninth life. In fact, the operation was successful. I had killed the cat. I remember that all the time I was generally sorry for the animal. I simply forced myself to carry out the experiment in the interest of pure science. Pure science and desensitizing of conditional, you know, con- conditioning his mind to actually wow you know most kids go in the bathroom and smoke a cigarette that's their rebellion he goes and slaughters a cat isn't that something yeah so it started from an early age for him i think uh do you think that's when he started his rebellion like do you think there was a turning point or just overall i think once he got to college that's when he became the what he wanted to be which uh was somebody who was interested in magic he was interested in poetry and he was interested in mountain climbing. And I think that was it. The, the magical stuff became very uh, hardcore black magic. That's really what he became interested in. There's all kinds of very carnal rituals and things like that. I'm going to tell you a side note just for, uh, um, you know, just for content's sake. Um, in, before I came to uh, Christ, I was dabbling in occultism. And um, I was getting a hold of some books, and I was too lazy to study them. So I 
kind of threw them aside and kind of made up my own magic path, my own way. Um, and I call that now, now seeing it in hindsight, I call it introverted, uh, you know, occultism where I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a, a coven. I was kind of dabbling in stuff and learning spells by just saying, hey, if I have this item in my hand, I can make it magical by just my will. I don't need an actual specific wand or anything like that. And then later when I started learning a little bit about Crowley's magic, I started realizing that I was doing some of the stuff he was without even knowing who he was. So there must be a definite spirit. I was doing things like looking at the nave of of a neck of somebody's um, getting into chakras and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get deep into it, but like concentrating so I can start to personify that person and then make them almost like a, a puppet control their actions. I was practicing stuff like that, and that's Crowley magic. And I can't believe how close I was without actually knowing what he did. Um, and he got it you know, from his influences, but I have to say there's a spiritual force there that has given you that knowledge because you don't know it on your own. But Crowley's influence, what, are, what were some of Crowley's influences? Like what stirred him or what did he come after to learn some of his craft? Well, he thought that he was the reincarnation of Eliphas Levy. So Eliphas Levy was a guy who wrote Key to the Mysteries. He's famous for the drawing of the Baphomet. So he really identified, not only identified with Eliphas Levy, but he copied a lot of his books and translated them. The real name was of Eliphas, Eliphas Levy was... Alfred Lewis Constant, he was a French uh, rebel priest, somebody who was a former Catholic. So Crowley really thought that these earlier people were influential upon him. He would read all that stuff. But he also became, from a very early age, after passing through all of the grades of uh, masonry, he got involved in what a group called the Golden Dawn. That The Golden Dawn was the new era of magic. So he's literally involved in ceremonial magic. And... Uh, that also, you know, he was doing all these rituals and that was one of the chief influences that he used to, f- in the future, create his own religion, which he called the Lima. Now, um, I know, I know Eliphas Levi from his, his drawing of the, the Knights Templar, um, image of Baphomet, Baphomet, and, uh, he, he drew the, the, the personification of as above, so below the goat head with the. The female breasts and the male phallic, um, the symbol of of opposites and unity of opposites. Didn't Crowley, uh, he had that incorporated in his uh, beliefs? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. So I think that everything that Eliphas Levy was very influential for him. You think John Dee at all? Yeah, he definitely did. He actually did some of the Dee Kelly rituals with his hapless follower, Newberg. They traveled to Algeria, like I mentioned earlier, and went to a oasis called Busada and used John Dee's approach, which was to have like a stone in a hat. And uh, they recited some of his rituals and supposedly a demon called, uh, oh, what's the name of it? A demon supposedly showed up and they had to banish it. So... Wow, Koranzon was the name of the demon. So, uh, all stuff that Dee and Kelly did. So the, uh, Crowley saw himself in that same kind of strain, and so did actually. So did uh, Leary. Yeah, yeah, Koranzon. I know that name. That's that's the name of a demon, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Um, yeah, John Dee. For those that don't know, was a he. He sat at as a mystic, uh, a cultist. Uh, um, was a council advisor for the queen queen elizabeth uh, back in the centuries and uh he took on the the monarch for uh, moniker or whatever it's called of of uh 007 that's where that story gets that right. secret service of the queen <laughs> the, your majesty's secret service but he was doing occultism and he was a big influence for magicians in the future yeah, yeah did um crowley ever cross paths with helena blavatsky no, but he did know of her work, and he included, when he created his own religion that had a whole bunch of different documents and things like that, he included her one of her books, which I think is called A Voice in the Silence, 
And so he knew of her and he appreciated some of her work. But he, I would say that he kind of came of age after she reached her apex. He was born in 1875. And if my memory serves me correct, she was doing a lot of her work around that. Right. Around that time. Uh, and so, but he really, he thought that she was uh, legit. So. Hmm. Did he, was he influenced by her, you think? Well, like I said, he included some of her stuff in his religion. So he would always categorize these works as class A, class B, class C. And I think the, he would definitely influenced her by her and there, thereby included her work in um, uh, his kind of, what he did is like, and this happens through masonry, is you have these grades that you would go up in his religion. So you would fulfill grade one, grade two, or degree one or two. I think his was all the way to 11. And so to attain and go higher up these grades, the top of which is Ipsissimus, you would have to study these documents and remember these documents. And according to Crowley, they were very rigorous. So different cult leaders or occult leaders have different levels of severity, but Crowley was extremely severe. So he would have all these people cutting themselves he had Victor Newberg cutting himself. I include that in my book. Uh, so you weren't allowed to say I. But in one of those steps, one of the books was Helena Blavatsky's work, A Voice, I think A Voice in the Silence was the title. Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I was cutting myself at the time, too. Didn't even know about all that. That's another link that I didn't but know. Would you, would you cut yourself when you said the word I? Because that's what Crowley wanted. He wanted people to dissolve their identity into a different identity. So it was only when Newberg... I didn't do the ritual. Okay. Yeah. It was only when Newberg... And you can see that in my book that he had some pretty severe cuts on his forearms. Wow. No, I just did it for my own ritual sake um, and anybody around me that would let, let me do it. That's another story. Uh, so, so like, his information, um, his... his the, the influence, didn't he channel some of it? Well, you can say that. I mean, he was definitely involved in received books. He had books, the Book of the Law. He said he received from this entity, uh, AWAS, in 1904 in Egypt over, over three days. I think it was April 8th, 9th, and 10th. And so that was one book that he channeled. He also called these other books the Holy Books, which came to him, he said, in a flash, which were also channeled. So... He was definitely inspired to write. So it's really, I think, up to the kind of reader or listener of Crowley to determine how much of the stuff he was making up or how much he was just, you know, coming from his subconscious. But according to Crowley, he was receiving books from other uh, entities. You know, it's interesting. I came across in my research in the 1700s when I was uh, researching Benjamin Franklin and uh, the Hellfire Club. Uh-huh. Came across uh, uh, Francois Rabelais, Rabelais, who actually is credited to coining the term "Do as thou wilt" is Correct. the whole of the law. Correct. Yeah. So, did he plagiarize that? Yes, absolutely. He referenced Rabelais. So. Oh, he does. So yeah. he does give. Does he give him credit for it? Yes, I think so. I think he knew okay. that that's where it was from, and uh, I guess the, the in that book by Rabelais, there was some ideal community where people were totally free, so it was ne se voudra, I think was the, the French phrase that was included on the entrance into the Hell, Hellfire Club. So, oh, okay. So he kind of just adopted it and, and form, no formed it into his philosophy of the lingua. Correct. Yeah, so he, okay. he definitely drew upon earlier stuff. He wasn't... It didn't come out a whole cloth. Uh, I think that he tied as much of his work to the number 11, so he was involved in numerology, definitely 77. And uh, he was clearly always doing Kabbalistic analyses of words and letters and things like that, which is why how he came up with Gema- the number 93, Gematria, correct? Yeah, Gematria, yeah. Wow. So l- let me ask you this, and uh, this is probably a question that comes up for you all, all the time. Was he really as dark and evil as he as as is claimed is this a reputation he got or uh, or like uh, uh, relished on or was it exaggerated drama to gain attention and respect for himself great question i do think that he exaggerated stuff to uh, to gain attention for himself he would always have these ridiculous public utterances 
whether it was in front of the Statue of Liberty in New York where he lived for a time during World War I, or in front of the obelisk of, uh, I think it was, Cleopatra in uh, London by the Thames. He would have these ridiculous things. But I think if you really look at all of his teachings, he actually did have references to child sacrifice. And in some of his writings, it was literal pedophilia. So I believe that he thought that his religion would allow these very evil, very malevolent things uh, to be permitted. So uh, I do think that, and he, I think he said in one of his things, I, I look, I know for a certain that my Lord will be enthroned on the earth. So he was looking forward to Satan being enthroned on the earth. Um, he was literally a Satanist then. I mean, a, the, the, no the left hand deity he, worshiping. No doubt. He just, you know, the thing is, is that he was sharp enough to describe. I mean, remember back then it was illegal to be into witchcraft or the occult. So he mm. had, he didn't have a choice. If he didn't want to be arrested, he would have to shield things through uh, coded meanings, much like the Masons did. So, um, once you've realized in one of his writings that Awas is Lucifer, I think he has this one paragraph that uh, is very telling. But there's no question that that's what the story is. And that's how the Book of the Law, the foundation of his religion, was received. He said it was received by Awas. Wow. It was like almost channeled from right. Satan himself. Right. Wow. Right. So that's now what he's I... claiming. That's, his, yeah. that's what he's claiming his authority. And I believe that He's he in, in integrated and inculcated into his religion all times, types of esoteric occult stuff from all around the world. That was kind of his goal. So did he sacrifice children and, and, and conduct pedophilia? And we hear homosexuality. I had a guy argue with me one time when I mentioned that. He says, do you realize that's just a, a, a reputation he got? He sponsored orphanages, I'm told. No, that's false. You know? that's totally yeah. False. He but was a he terrible also... parent. He didn't care about kids. And there's no question that he advocated homosexuality. He talked about it. He wanted to turn all of um, the UK to that practice. A lot of his religions are involved in that type of practice. And he, in his own writing, he admits to pedophilia. So uh, a lot of people in put their own perceptions into Crowley instead of actually reading Crowley and understanding what he meant. And he talked about children rituals. Uh, explain that, what he Correct. says about... So, well, here's the thing, is that what they do, a lot of these apologists for Crowley go to uh, magic and theory and practice, and they talk about one thing, but what they don't talk about is Lieber 66, which talks about child sacrifice and the world tragedy, which talk about child sacrifice. So there are real elements in Crowley's you know, corpus that talk about child sacrifice. It's undoubtable, but they, I think the people who really know Crowley know they can trick the public by referencing things that they can explain away and know and hope that nobody will actually pick up something and read it. So all you have to do to figure out Crowley advocated child sacrifice is read Lieber 66 or The World's Tragedy. Wow. And he talked about the younger the child, the higher the power of the energy. Right, exactly. So that's from magic and theory. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he talked about it in a very intellectual level. He said that all magical practice is dependent upon the energy within the animal itself and the highest work for the highest working, the most energy is in a young male child of perfect innocence. Now, people want to know why we talk about him and the influence in society. You know, they say that's their world. Why do we have to get into their world? Why do we have to care? After seeing pedophilia being expressed in our society, Jeffrey Epstein, and maybe Jeffrey Epstein and such, you know, even we get uh, reports of those in the Vatican that are practicing pedophilia and uh, child abuse, uh, sexual rituals. We have to say in the Illuminati, of course, uh, who, who do it on their own children, we we have to say, you know, were they influenced by Aleister Crowley? But nonetheless, they all practice those same routines. Uh, so whether Crowley is getting the influence, um, you know, the the forerunner of the influence or came up in ancient times, Crowley definitely incorporated into his philosophy sexual magic and change, put a K at the end to differentiate between stage magic, right? Right, correct. K being the 11th letter in the alphabet. Oh, 
I didn't see that tie. Wow, he right, had a yeah, lot of 11s. Tons of 11s, yeah. Tons of 11s. Oh. By the way, I just put out my new movie, a Cult Hollywood Volume 2, where I talk about all the numerology that's involved in Hollywood that you see without really knowing, per- particularly Kubrick, whose monolith, the mysterious monolith from 2001, is exactly 11 feet tall. And in Eyes Wide Shut, the sex magic scene, there are 11 female servitors. So uh, Kubrick himself understood the primacy of the same numbers that Crowley understood the same primacy of. Wow. I want to talk a little bit about the numbers in a second. Um, I just want to set the foundation here about where he came from and he influenced... He tried to enter the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, as you said, and I, I hear that he was actually flushed out because he wanted to include um, uh, drugs in the rituals, and he actually was more diabolical than they were. Correct. So he had a bad reputation even back then, and he definitely was kind of like the black sheep among the group that were involved in the Golden Dawn, and he wanted to ascend up the grades, and actually the well-known poet Yates was one of his antagonists and he had kind of a an actual kind of street battle with uh w william butler yates in the spring of i think it was 1899 or something like that yates said a mystical fraternity is not a moral reformatory so he knew that crowley was kind of bad news anyway they he went to uh go up the grades and then they had a fight and so he actually um, published these secret documents and there's a lawsuit that's recorded between the owner of the real copyright of these uh, magical rituals and Crowley who sent it out. And, and uh, the judge thought it was highly amusing that there were two believers in magic in a uh, lawsuit together. So, Didn't he also have a confrontation with uh, McGregor Matthews and right. what McG- they call the magical wars? <laughs> right. So it was McGregor Mathers. So he, McGregor Mathers was really one of his top influences other than Eliphas Levy. So at one point, McGregor Mathers had written books that Crowley would be influenced by books upon uh, about the Kabbalah and some of these other rituals. So eventually they, Crowley kind of turned on Mathers and that's the person who he had a lawsuit with. So yeah, McGregor, McGregor Mathers. So he branched off and started his own, uh, was the AA his? Right, so it was the Astrum Argentum, was really kind of his first, um, it was his kind of first group that he was involved with. It was a group that you could basically be a, you know, somebody who would write about, you could write him and you could be a follower. So the AA was really the start, and then he became involved with the OTO. He had kind of a, a meeting was the OTO was a German secret society, the Ordo Templi Orientis, and then eventually Crowley would become the head of the OTO in 1925. Yeah, and they uh, they kind of they're an offshoot of the Illuminati, from what I understand, or claim to be, correct? Um, because they take on a lot of that satanic ritual, traumatized ritual practices, and we see even that um, going into Hollywood and performers and such like that. I want to talk about that in a little bit, but. Um, he also was a, accepted as a, a agent in MI5 in the British right. intelligence. So before the intelligence, the MI5 I think is state intelligence for UK, and then MI6 is, inter, is international. But before that, there was a group called the uh, Secret Intelligence Service, of which Crowley was most likely a member all the way to his death. So when he was traveling around, he had been to strange places. He'd been to Russia, he had been to Germany, he had been to Italy, at very and France at all these times. He'd actually been kicked out of France and Italy uh, in time, but he was probably a member of this group, and then it got re, reformed, but uh, I think it was a famous book called, uh, what was his name, Secret Agent 666 by Richard Spence, where he did some actual hands-on research and came across a document that said that was from I think the FBI or I can't remember who it was, military intelligence that said Alistair Crowley was an employee of the British government in this country on official business, which the British consul, New York City, has full cognizance. So it basically tagged him as a British intel agent. That's interesting. 
and you know despite was that before all his magic or no it was during it during the whole time so so, so they know he's doing all this magic and pedophilia and stuff and they still accept him as an well, agent well yeah exactly well they, i don't know if they knew the totality of what his depravity was but they always and that's actually strangely not uncommon among intelligence agents is that a lot of these guys are occultists because they um don't have the same moral code that other people do so there, That's definitely, true. there definitely is a correlation between occultism and, and intelligence. If you look at the founding of the CIA in 1947, the guys who were sitting there writing, signing the NSA creation with Truman, like four of the seven are all skull and bones guys. They're all, they're all, right. female. so, um, and you can go up through the Bush family and all this stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little more prevalent than you might think. That's true. Yeah, we 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 do <laughs> research that. So I guess I uh, I stand corrected. I forget about that tie-in. You know, how could they allow a cultist? But well, it's the, interesting those you say that because agents. well, the guy who made Crowley an OTM member was also a German occultist. So you know, these guys are on and Hitler's an occultist. Crowley's an occultist. It's just like they're all involved in this kind of secret knowledge uh, program. Yeah, intelligence is based on occultism and uh, rituals, and uh, I mean, look at MK Ultra, based on you know mind control, traumatizing, uh, and sexual rituals and abuse and studies and you know studies in the name of research or whatever. But you know, it, it, it's prevalent in these fields. So you know, rituals and astral projection they do for Absolutely. spying techniques. I mean, yes. it's amazing how how these guys incorporate magic. I mean, right. there's whole so you can you can government. say like Menu Steric Goats is this uh, known government program here in the states, but Crowley himself was involved in astral projection fifty years before that, traveling around saying he's talking to other people in the world, involved in astral projection. So it's pretty incredible that this kind of uh, theme of astral projection really does exist. And they have Michael Aquino, who uh, likely was influenced by him, and Definitely. he was a lieutenant or colonel in the in the right. in, in the uh, in the military, uh, high ranking, and he was involved in mind control. But he, you know, his order, uh, the Temple of Set, with satanic rituals and such, and you know, so this is you're right. This is well. Prevalent. If you read their stuff, if you read Aquino stuff, if you read Levey, they knew about Crowley. They're aware of Crowley. They've either digested him they knew of his followers in in northern california where they were set and uh aquino himself wrote an interesting military paper called mind war i think it was mm -hmm. from what was the name of it? i can't remember the the subtitle but um stone cold mind control from psyop to mind war i think it was called was the subtitle mm. so you just constantly are making war against people's minds it's pretty incredible Wow. And then even subtle, uh, you know, science. And uh, we, we talk about uh, NASA and, and jet rocketry with Jack Parsons, who was influenced by Crowley and the OTO. Well, Jack Parsons wasn't merely influenced by the OTO. He was considered to be Aleister Crowley's most important disciple. So he right, ran the right. lodge in in, um, in Los Angeles. And there's a strange angel is the show that's on TV now that's talking. I haven't watched it yet, but basically it's supposed to be retelling the story of Jack Parsons. who was a founding member of, um, what is it? So he did the JTO as a jet assistant takeoff for JPL, the jet propulsion lab. So you have a stone cold mm -hmm. occultist who's doing rituals at night, Crowley rituals. Um, who's living with L Ron Hubbard who started Scientology, which L. Ron Hubbard's son said was black magic over a longer period of time, which is still influencing people in Hollywood today. So you can't really say that Crowley was just some atomized hacker, like somebody who didn't have any influence, because people all the way up in today are either referencing material, absorbing his material, using his material for... Scientology, because uh, the early times of Scientology, and this there's actually recordings of this, Hubbard is talking about Crowley. He's talking about his material, how interesting it is. His son has said he has all these Crowley materials he's reading and integrating. So it's much more present than people might, might understand. 
in our government, in our society, I mean, influential in NASA, it's amazing how we can say, well, this doesn't really impact us. This doesn't really have anything to do with us. Let's just blow it off. But, you know, it, it comes down to the symbolism that's used. And we know that um, symbolism is, is, is used to communicate between occultists. But uh, Crowley had his own set of uh, symbolism, chaos magic, from what I understand, a broken pentagram, which which means chaos magic, and then his numerology rituals, which there is rituals of numerology. You explained some of the numbers. Um, was eleven? Right. I mean, I'd 22. say that Crowley's primary numbers are eleven, seventy-seven, and ninety-three. Ninety-three okay. for him equaled to the Greek words thelema and agape, so will and love. And Crowley's dictum was love under law, love under will. So oftentimes, Thelemites will sign things 93, 93, 93 to symbolize, numerically symbolize those, symbolize those terms. And 77 references his, his Liber Oz, Liber 77, the, the number of Babylon. So there's 77 names of Satan. Um, and 11 is really the number of magic and the number of the New World Order. So for Crowley, the 5 and the 6 are the macrocosm and the microcosm that come together in the magician so it's really a magical prime number and uh which is why they were all integrated into the events of 9-11 probably why the date of the event itself was 9-11 yeah nine um uh you know nine skipping 10 and 11 from what we hear from people like uh, freeman um fly uh it has a meaning to that that from i guess from Individual spirituality, skipping the divine, going to chaotic magic in 11. Um, I guess it, it it really intensifies the meaning. So are, are these occultists actually planning this using Crowley magic, or is there just a spiritual tie well, that that's connects a great all question. these? Yeah, that's a good question. Here's, here's, this is one of the founders of the Golden Dawn. He writes in his book, Numbers, Their Occult Power and Mystic Virtue, about the number of 11. This seems to have been the type of number with an evil reputation among all peoples. The Kabbalists contrasted it with the perfection of the Decad, the Ten. And just as the Sephirotic number is the form of all good things, so Eleven is the essence of all that is sinful, harmful, and imperfect. With the Ten Sephiroth, they contrasted the Eleven Averse Sephiroth, symbols of destruction, violence, defeat, and death. So that's kind of a Kabbalistic analysis similar to Freeman's analysis. And, right, uh, wow. I mean, I think the thing is, is that if they are really high-level occultists, I don't think they have a choice but to follow this, kind of like if it is a Christian, you don't have a choice but to follow the the meaning and doctrines within uh, Scripture or within the New Testament. So Christians themselves have numbers, Ephesians 6.12, John, what is it, John 3.16, you know, so these things that reference meanings, right? So the, the occultists have their own numbers that reference meaning. Oh, that's a good point. Um, you know, people ask me, you know, wh why why do you have to know the numbers? And I explain it to them. I didn't even think of those references. Like we have, you know, 316 automatically reminds us of John 316. Uh, you know, God so loved the world. He gave, gave his, his only, only begotten, begotten son. son. Yeah. And and Ephesians six with the wrestling, uh, we wrestle not with not flesh and blood. Flesh and blood right? So, yeah, and so they're when they mention eleven and twenty two, and we see this in society. You mentioned uh, you're working on a, a film with some of this stuff, right? I'm done. I just finished it. Yeah, I just finished a cold Hollywood, so people can see it on Vimeo. It's my second volume. I cover, I try to uncover the pedophilia and occultism in Kubrick, which a lot of people don't really recognize is there. And there's actually a tie-in between 2001 A Space Odyssey and the events of September 11th and 2001. So I think people need to understand the high-level post-Masonic occultism. They want to under, really understand these uh, dark occult events that have happened within our lifetimes. Wow. And he uh, he branded women with Correct. his mark of the beast, from Correct. what I I hear so too. Crowley, like like we talked about earlier, he t he identified with the imagery of the Book of Revelation, the beast, the scarlet women, the, and all this stuff. So when he had a woman who the women seemed to have some kind of uh, 
magical sensitivity or something that where they were more receptive. So when Crowley's life, these women became like, they be, he called them his scarlet women. They were his magical partners. And so every one of his scarlet women, I think there were a total of nine or 10, I can't remember in his lifetime, he would take a literal brand with his mark of the beast, which was a conjunction of all the planets together. So Crowley created his little mark of the beast and he brand them on their chest. Do you think that's where this Nexium Keith Rainier got that in, from? In part, it might be. It might be. I actually thought that. So he might be involved in this branding kind of like Crowley did. Did you know that Keith Rainier you know, would tell his followers that he was Lucifer? Oh, no, I didn't yeah. even know that. Yeah, you can look that up on Frank Parlato's uh, uh, website. But, yeah, he was calling people, I'm Lucifer. So he was very much into the occult. He knew Scientology. A lot of the stuff involved in his cult was directly referenced in Scientology. Do you know his office is a uh, less than a mile from where I grew up? No, I didn't know that. So you're close to Albany or somewhere up there? Yeah, yeah I'm in Albany, yeah. yeah. Yep, it's in Colony, a village in Colony. Uh, uh, it, it, it's right down the street from my dad's office. Well, there's a <laughs> lot of suspicious stuff that happened with Ranieri, but he seemed to really be uh, knowing about this kind of cult behavior. He really knew it. Must have been influencing uh, him, you know? That's the scary thing is that a lot of these guys, they don't tell you that they're influenced by them, but you have to kind of figure it out on your own good volition. Oh, it's easy to see the ties once you know what you're looking for, That's like true. we're explaining. Good point. Good point. You know, now people should be able to kind of see some of it in society or in their favorite movies or, you know, with looking at numbers. and. Right. Look at, uh, I was talking to the guy the other day, Harry Potter is full of this numerology. Harry Potter, two together, his name is an 11. His wand is 11 inches long. It's, it's all there. Oh, wow. Yeah. I knew it had uh, steeped in uh, occult, um, yeah. you know, numerology and such, but I didn't, I didn't oh, know about the 11s. All and... All well, Harry Potter, right, is a five and a six letter name. So just like we talked about before, the five and the six come together to make the magician. So Harry Potter as a little kid is like the budding magician. And there's many uh, writers and Hollywood producers and such influenced by uh, Aleister Crowley. Absolutely. I mean, I talk about in my new film, I talk about Polanski, who clearly knows some of the stuff. His film, The Ninth Gate, includes some of Crowley's Marriage of the Beast and Scarlet Woman ritual. So there's very overt things. There's 11s in his his uh, movie, The Ghost Writer. So there's it just suffuses people like Polanski, Stone, Oliver Stone, people probably be surprised about. Um. Yeah, it's it's definitely there. Once you keep an eye open for it, you'll see the numerology. It's pretty shocking. Well, we got Jay Z openly having a shirt "Do as thou wilt." I mean, is he is he not that obvious or what? Right. And you have this other guy, um, Ab Soul, who's apparently, oh, excuse me, a well known uh, musician who has "Do What Thou Wilt" on his back. He put a big tattoo of that. So, African American oh, guy stuff. loves Crowley. Yeah. And he influenced uh, Manson, uh, influenced the Beatles, the Doors, Black Sabbath, right? right, Ozzy. Right. I mean, all these guys seem to know Crowley. It's pretty incredible. Jim Morrison, one of their albums, has they're sitting on a bust of Crowley, and Jim Morrison has his hands right on top of Crowley. Wow. And even Crosby, Stills, and Nash, I guess uh, Crosby once said that... Uh, we love the performances because it's a place that you can mesmerize and cast a spell on on, on wow, thousands of people at once. Didn't know that. He says things like that, and then you know the Grateful Dead, obviously with the drugs and the LSD, LSD tied in with Leary, tied in with OTO, tied in with Crowley, and also their members were were members of Bohemian Grove, right? Um, and they were CIA agents as well. Yeah. It gets incredible, man. I mean, I've heard the story that uh, Leary himself was either a CIA or FBI mole. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Lady Gaga with her persona and stuff, and then she comes out with a perfume of of uh, uh, supposedly synthetic semen and blood, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and we know that she visits she visits um, Marina Ab- Abramovic. Right. Do you know that? Right. Do you know, know that house is about 20 minutes from me, too? Or not 20, it's about it's 20 miles? 
her cottage is 20 miles from So are you house. saying that Abramovich lives up there? Yeah, she has a cottage in, in Columbia County, wow. uh, next county over from me. That's, that's crazy. I've been by her house. You know, I haven't seen it from the road. It's hard to see, but I guess it's shaped like a pentagram. And yeah, I'd I was to wondering see a picture if, of that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, I can tell you how much she bought it for and everything. I, I did a little research on it. How much anyway, did she buy it for? Problem. It was, uh, at the time, I think it was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was like $900,000. Oh, man, so she has a ton of money. Yeah, somehow. It has like four bedrooms, I think. Uh, I can't remember now. It, it was actually in, I was I saw it in New Yorker magazine, and when I was reading it, it said it, her house is in upstate New York, and I never knew it. So I looked it up, and lo and behold, the, the stats, the real estate stats are right there. So looked it up, found out where it is. It's on Route 66. Well, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. That's what she probably knows that. So 66 I'm probably is telling divisible by 11, right? The, yeah, the last time I revealed this, I had my uh, car window smashed in, so I don't know if that was uh, relevant or, <laughs> or go not. Read, I better be careful. If you want to really have a bad day, go read Aleister Crowley's Libra 66. The child yeah, sacrifice see? is right there. It says the the blood will cover the, the temple like wine or something like that. So that's... Yeah, he he did he six is where his number. I wonder if you know eleven's really have, the prime number. It actually comes from the book of the law as well. The book of the law. Oh says yeah, yeah, eleven. Eleven is okay. our number. So inter- interesting enough, when when nowadays, I mean, we don't mean to make light of these incidents that come out, um, these traumas that come out, like the Texas shooting re- recently, but me and my friends often take a look at the first reported numbers and the divisions of you know uh, of what what they what they express and you'll see the numbers um 18 which is a, a three sixes and then you see like 22 shot and it's deliberate the numbers they use and 22 reminds me of 11 and 11 so i wonder if it's part of uh, crowley rituals that had sparked the the triggers of these uh incidences you know right Okay, so here's a reference to Libra 66, line 21. Then again, the master shall speak as he will soft words with music, and what else he will bring forward the victim. And also he shall slay a young child upon the altar, and the blood shall cover the altar with a perfume as of roses. Wow. Yes, it's right there. And then, you, like I said, you get the Lady Gaga perfume with semen and the ritual perfume. Right, and then uh, Abramovich is what, spirit cooking that ties into yep. Podesta, who is the chief of staff or the campaign manager for Clinton. You think that that's not mm-hmm. all connected? I mean, if anybody thinks that's not all connected, they're very naive. And a, and a lot of people don't want to see the connection, so they you know they tell us to turn it off. And but you know we're revealing this stuff in society because it's out there and it's 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 a uh, it's prevalent. It, it's 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 in your face. It's obvious, hidden in plain sight, as they say, right. if you know what to look for. But if you do know what to look for, you you can detect where their rituals are present and and you know maybe get behind who's who's doing this, pray against it. Um, stay away from it. Uh, warn o- others. You know, Ephesians right. talks about warning those. You know, don't join their practices, but rather expose them. Expose and that's them, right. sort of what we do here. Yes, yeah. you know. it's good work. Anything? Anything else you want to uh, speak on? Before? No, I mean, but if people want to see my new film, you can go to see a cold Hollywood. You can also go to Vimeo um, and look at Smiley Face Killers, a film I did too. So, people are interested in some information they probably won't find elsewhere. Uh, go check it out. Great. And what's your website and your YouTube? Well, I let my website go right now. My YouTube channel is William Ramsey Investigates. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Great. And that's uh, that's where you can get his information. That's uh, William Ramsey. And uh, stick around, uh, William, and I'll just close you out uh, cool. as I close out the show here. Right, cool. um, so I think.